A couple weeks ago, we released a 30 minute long Q&A video that we shot two hours of footage for. It was very hard to get it down to 30 minutes, uh, but there were some things that ended up on the cutting room floor that we thought you might like to see that we thought were kind of entertaining. Uh, so that is what follows. One short correction though, uh, before we get too far, um, you are about to hear me answer a question in which I refer to my partner, Molly, who has since become my wife, uh, but I still watch her make the void mayonnaise. That hasn't changed. Hope you enjoy. Chris McLennan, I do talk to my car like it's a person. In fact, um, it, it's uh, it doesn't have a very good name. My my, my truck's name is Truck, uh, and what is worse, uh, it has a voice that talks back, and it sounds something like this. I also talk to my dog like he's a person. Um, I don't do a voice for him, uh, though I do pretend that he is responding to me. So uh, if there is anybody, like I imagine that there is all kinds of information, that uh, all kinds of conversations that my Alexa, uh, my Amazon Echo has recorded, where it's just me having a one-sided conversation with someone else who's not in the room, but it's actually just my dog looking at me like, what are you? What are you doing? Mace Curb and a couple other people wanted to know what video games I am currently playing. Uh, so I am currently obsessed with this really tiny uh, sort of shmup roguelike mashup called Monolith, which is on Steam, it's PC only, it costs $8 and I have sunk many hours into it. It's, I'm not even gonna bother trying to explain it. It's worth it, go buy it, it's super fun. Uh, I also have been playing a lot of Dead Cells recently in downtime. Uh, I just started playing Shadow of Mordor, uh, which I never played when it came out. It was on sale in the Steam sale for uh, like $3, so I picked it up. Um, I am most of the way through a playthrough of Nier Automata. Um, and uh, I, I, watch, um, I watch Molly, uh, my partner, play Stardew Valley. Um, a lot. I watch her as she says, make the void mayonnaise. And to answer Sticky Scissors' question, um, I mostly play games on a PC uh, that actually Jake Roper from Vsauce 3 um, built for me uh, that I then purchased from him. Uh, I've replaced some parts since then, but Jake, if you end up watching this, PC still running great. Um, changed my life. Lisa Heathmar uh, wants to know about all the books that are here. Um, instead of spending the time going through them, <laughs> as since you guys just suffered through a long list not too long ago, um, I will put uh, a link in the description uh, as to that lists every book that is on the set. Uh, it has changed a little bit um, since we have had this set, but uh, I will put the most current iteration. Um, yeah, the end. As far as Anne Lawant's question, um, pieces of media that have shaped me, there's actually a lot of isomorphism between these two, uh, but... Um, you know, there are a, a, a few differences. Um, Robert Ashley's full opera improvement had a huge impact in the way I think about um, writing, uh, delivering written uh, text, uh, performance, music, how all those things come together, the purpose of, um, of performance as an artwork, the things that you're allowed to do as a performer, uh, that had a huge, huge impact on me. Um, Edward Tufte's books, uh, which are on the Idea Channel set, so a little spoiler for the list that's forthcoming, um, had a big impact on me as far as thinking about details and treating things that seem minor with an importance, making sure that you give thought to um, things that seem um, middling or useless, um, and also the sort of excitement and importance in being able to explain things to people. Um, uh, I also was really influenced uh, by uh, Zanakis's GRM works, which are on, uh, it's on the wall over here, um, some early electronic music works that he made that sort of challenged my idea of what music could be. Um, uh, Naked Lunch by William S. Burroughs had a huge impact on me uh, as far as sort of um, what a novel could be, what writing is for, uh, how you can challenge an audience, what kinds of things you're allowed to put between two covers and call a book. Uh, the more I think about it, actually, the more Shadowrun had a big impact on me. Um, I played it more as an adult than I did as a kid, uh, but the universe and the ideas contained therein, I think, really shaped a lot of my ideas about um, I don't know, technology and also just genre in general. Uh, I think that my ideas about genre have a lot to do with how s the cyberpunk genre works. Um, again, Borges, Bob Ross. I watched a ton of Bob Ross as a kid and his, his sort of sense of like, just do it. Like anyone can be a painter, just give it a try with a little bit of practice. You too can make things that you're proud of is something that I still draw from today and still try to sort of uh, live that wisdom 
Um, and, um, you know, actually, you could also watch, uh, I did an interview with uh, Sarah Green from The Art Assignment about my five, sort of five favorite works of art, and that might be another another place to sort of get some insight into the things that have had an impact on me or, uh, or the artists. Z Doomsday, uh, yes, I absolutely can. I want to provide a caveat, which is that book recommendations are a highly personal thing, so giving a book recommendation to thousands of people at one time is a pursuit that will fail. But I will say this, Between the World and Me by ta Coates, um, it is a book about a perspective that I, you know, I do not have and opened my eyes. It is deeply emotional, highly affecting. Um, the Autobi Autobiography of Red by Ann Carson, um, one of my favorite pieces of sort of long form poetry, experimental text, like a good reuse of pre-existing material and a great sort of masterclass in character building and also like typesetting in a way that's very different from like, you know, adventurous typesetting like uh, House of Leaves might be. Um, Perfect Vacuum by Stanislaw Lem, um, which is sort of like a, uh, it's a collection of short sci-fi stories that contain lots of ideas that are still, um, still uh, like new and exciting today. Um, anything you want to read by Borges, I love it. And um, my favorite fiction book of all time, um, Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco. Grease 49, um, the single most non-work non related thing uh, that I have invested time and money in is uh, probably it's music gear. Uh, I have uh, um, several guitars, uh, a, a couple, some synthesizers, including a modular synth, um, you know, a small guitar pedal collection. Um, I mean, those things were work related at one point, uh, but I guess they are less and less work related now uh, as that becomes something that I do sort of more for fun. Uh, though I guess those things do have a place in the creation of Reasonably Sound. But uh, actually, this makes me think of a question that uh, that someone asked that didn't make it onto the onto the final list, but I'm going to answer it now. So I, I apologize for not knowing uh, the name of the person who asked it off the top of my head. But they asked about what it's like to be a musician who does the kind of work that I do on Idea Channel. And I just want to say really quickly that I think actually those two things are more related than it might seem at first blush, that like, what making music is often about is both literally and symbolically like connecting systems uh, that like you are connecting groups of things in order to create a final output that is um, I think you know uh, surprising inviting challenging you know ideally a combination of these things and you can do that with literal boxes or pieces of gear uh, or you can do it with musical ideas written notes on a page um, and I think you know that like this system of symbolic meaning that you tie together in order to create a surprising output is kind of <laughs> kind of describes idea channel and kind of describes critical thought in um, in a really sort of succinct way. Carl Tigerstorm wants to know which philosophers I would have a coffee slash beer with, um, would hold awkward, awkward conversation with to be polite, would duck out of a bar uh, if I saw them at the door, um, and would block on Facebook despite the fact that they want to keep talking to me. Um, I love this question, and I love this question so much more than who are your favorites or, you know, who is the most interesting, um, because I get to think about these people in a new way. So I think that I would love to have so there's some ties here. Um, coffee slash beer, I think, is a tie between Maurice Merleau-Ponty, um, uh, the phenomenologist, and uh, Donna Haraway, uh, who is currently living. So Donna Haraway, that's one that I could maybe even work out. Um, I'm currently reading her um, Staying with the Trouble, uh, her new book. And yeah, I just, I really want to have a conversation with her. She seems great and very interesting. Um, Awkward conversation is complicated because there are several different kinds of awkward conversation. So I'm just going to list three philosophers that I can imagine having awkward conversation with and let you decide what the quality of that awkward conversation is. Um, they are Simone de Beauvoir, um, Jacques, Jacques Derrida, and Jean Baudrillard. Uh, I feel like I feel like for many reasons I could have three very different kinds of awkward conversation with those three people. Um, seeing them coming in uh, and would le would leave or would hide. Immanuel Kant. I just I uh, yeah. I'm gonna not explain why. I feel like maybe that's clear. I just am not interested. <laughs> um, block me on Facebook, despite the fact that they want to keep talking to me, is definitely and without a doubt Slavoj Žižek. Uh, this is also incidentally uh, the answer to Robin, Robin Miller's question, which is that if I could play a one-shot TTRPG uh, for a day with three people living or dead, who would they be? It would be some assortment of, of three people from this previous list. Who would be the DM, though, is the question. Uh, and, I mean, I would, I would be honored to DM, but man, if Donna Haraway were interested and willing, 
I bet she'd be pretty good. Tori B. Sue Random and I'm High Sloppy uh, were curious about how the show has changed over time and um, how the content has changed as we've grown, um, as the audience has grown, as I've grown. And I think that this is, it's very, very hard to say. And I am probably the least capable person of, of describing um, how exactly we've changed since I'm so close to it. But what I will say is this, which is that when we started, I think the goal was to say weird and unexpected things in as entertaining a way as possible and to just see how people would react. And that it really did come from this place of like, let's put things together and see what happens and you know, try to just inspire conversation using whatever we can get our, ha get our hands on. Um, but especially focusing on things that don't seem important, uh, that seem like obviously, um, obviously lowbrow or obviously shallow, e.g. popular culture. Um, and I think that as we've worked on the show um, and as we have gained a platform and as I have sort of come into my own opinions about the world, which have you know, been formulated largely as a result of the work that I've done on Idea Channel, the people that I've met because of Idea Channel, um, we took on a greater mandate to have, um, you know, like a sense of responsibility about what we're saying and a sense of responsibility to our audience. And uh, there is, you know, that caused me to sort of confront how I thought about the world, how I think about audiences, how I think about media, um, what I think is important about it. And I think that it, it's clear if you watch, you know, over the length of the show that there is, there is a growth in sort of the the importance with which we treat these things. And that I think at first we thought of a lot of the materials that we confronted as simply materials, and that as the show grew up, we thought of them as um, much more much more meaningful and much more important than just, you know, grist for the mill. Sir Hendrix wants to know who my epic protagonist would be, and I would say that it would be someone who is um, down to earth, humble, still very good at their job, um, maybe has like, questionable methods uh, or, you know, isn't, isn't pro um, in the way that uh, that stereotype would indicate, uh, that they are sort of maybe something of a savant. Um, and I think someone who is, even given that, um, open to outside suggestions, open to help, and always willing to collaborate. So I think really what I'm saying is that my epic protagonist is basically Dale Cooper. Lucas Mollo wants to know whether or not I think that science has surpassed philosophy in the sense that there were questions that philosophy thought were unanswerable, um, but then science went on to answer. And I would say that it's tough to claim that philosophy claims there are questions that are completely unanswerable. And I would also say that there is no practice of science that does not contain or require philosophy. And I think that the idea of one of them being more important or more useful, one of them surpassing the other, um, or you know, one of them sort of having more impact is incorrect, and I think a, a misunderstanding of the relationship between the two. I think science needs philosophy just as much as philosophy needs science, that they are co-pursuits. It's like saying, you know, um, has architecture surpassed art because architecture builds things that people use every day? It's like, well, that's not really what the, you know, that's a, that's a misunderstanding of the relationship between those two things. To your final question, Lucas, though, uh, one which Elliot Collins also asks, you know, if a tree falls in the wood in the woods, it, does it make a sound? Um, and, uh, you know, Lucas wants to know how I feel about this. So this is a great time for me to plug my podcast in the first episode of which I discuss this very question. <laughs> Chad, uh, I think the answer to this question is yes. I mean, I you know, I consider starting a, a nerdy channel by myself every day. I got, you know, tons of ideas for nerdy channels. And, um, you know, one of them was Idea Channel and one of them is the stuff that I put on my personal channel. Um, as far as asking whether or not you, you know, I, I'm assuming that what you want to know is if after Idea Channel, I expect to make another YouTube show. And I honestly don't know. Um, I think that it's going to be a question of taking some time, seeing where there is a market gap, uh, for lack of a less clinical term, and then going from there. And that if uh, the thing that it seems like is needed is another YouTube show, then I'll pursue that. If it's a podcast, then I'll pursue that. If it's writing projects, I'll pursue that. Um, but I think, you know, I am not planning on getting rid of my personal YouTube channel. Uh, and I think if anything, I am planning on, you know, making some stuff for it where, you know, 
um, the ideas that didn't fit Idea Channel um, never got a home. Maybe that will eventually be their home. Granny and a bunch of other people wanted to know whether or not it was appropriate to thumbs up or thumbs down the announcement that Idea Channel was ending. And, you know, this is just, this is the problem with the whole fave, like, dislike regime. It's very complicated. I would say, in my mind, both a thumbs up and a thumbs down are read as positive. Uh, I read them as positive. Thumbs up, I, I see as like, hey, it's been a good run. I understand your reasoning, um, and this makes perfect sense. Good luck, uh, and also maybe thank you for telling us. I don't read a thumbs up as <laughs> good riddance, get out of here. And I read thumbs down as being like, no, don't go, which though, you know, is sad, is something that like I appreciate that, you know, I appreciate the fact that Idea Channel means a lot to a lot of people, and they'll be sad that it will end. Um, so yeah, thumbs up, thumbs down on that video. You go crazy. It's also, I have never mentioned this before, I don't think, um, but uh, across most of our library of videos, I rate both thumbs up and thumbs downs as positive because it means someone had an interaction. So for those videos where like our like-dislike ratio is completely like it's all dislikes because um, the internet shouty men showed up, um, I mean, those make my day just as much as, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of thumbs up, if not if not more so, because man, if those people are mad, I think I'm probably doing something right. Nick Lucid, so I could go for probably 40 minutes about what makes a good DM, and I, and I will also introduce the caveat, which is that, like, I might be good, but I'm not gr great. Like, I have friends who are DMs that I look up to. So um, I will share with you the two things that I try to keep in mind um, and that I struggle with um, and, and try to make sure I incorporate into my games. And the first is to not create, um, don't over-prepare. Don't make a story that you need your players to tell, where you need them to like figure out exactly how to tell the story that you've put together. I find it's always much more effective to put together a situation, to know what all of your NPCs um, um, motivations are, what they're inspired by, what their relationships are, um, and maybe have a light idea of an inciting incident and several pathways that your players can follow, um, but don't railroad them. Don't give them, um, don't expect them to do exactly the thing that you're setting out for them to do. Um, and then relatedly, let your players follow their bliss. If there's something that they are very clearly excited about, um, you know, try to allow them to do it, regardless of whether or not it's something that you've prepared for. Uh, if you can figure out how to weave it in to something that you've prepared, even better, uh, that's like a great skill. If you feel confident improvising against it um, and just going into uncharted territory that you didn't prepare for, uh, I think that's even better. Um, but don't let your players, um, you should let your players tell their own story. Don't force them to tell a story that you want to tell. Well, that was fun. I hope you enjoyed seeing a few extra A's to some Q's. Uh, just a reminder, we do not have a scripted episode this week, uh, and there will be Mario comment responses coming out on Friday. We're going to be taking the next two weeks off, and then the week of August the 14th, we will be uploading the first of the final three Idea Channel episodes. So we're getting into the home stretch. We are still working on the details for the uh, final um, uh, office hours meetup idea channel party. Um, we don't have a date nailed down yet, but if you want to be super safe, uh, keep your weekends towards the end of August and beginning of September, you know, light, sort of free. It's the safest option right now. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit. Links to those in the doobly-doo alongside links to my Twitter, Instagram, and personal YouTube account, and my podcast, Reasonably Sounds, Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud. This week's Tweet of the Week comes from Coelophy, who painted an amazing portrait of me, which is just the most flattering thing that people would spend this much time thinking about and looking at my face. It's really, that's amazing, Coelophy, who, and I hope that I'm saying your name right, but thank you. And last but certainly not least, this week's Q&A part two would not have been possible or good without the very hard work of these bliss-following DMs. 